today, uh, hopefully, we'll wrap this up with a little bit of research direction. So, uh, if you uh, if you're interested and want to contribute, what should be your focus? That's the whole point of discussing this. Um, so, as we have already mentioned, deep power pipelines need much better predictions because your uh, misprediction penalty increases because the distance from the time you make a prediction to the time you execute the branch is essentially the cycles lost if you make a misprediction because during this time you'll be fetching along the wrong path. So uh, just to give you some example, although these are kind of old example, um, which R10K has a five stage integer pipeline. So that's just like what we are doing. Um, Alpha 21264 has a seven stage integer pipeline. Intel Pentium 4 Extreme Edition has a 31 plus stage integer pipeline. So this was actually when Intel uh, peaked in terms of frequency. So it was um, 40 gigahertz, around 40 gigahertz frequency. So to get frequency, they were making the pipe deeper and deeper. So um, what this means is that essentially that you can assume that in this 31 plus stage integer pipeline, you will make a branch prediction quite early in the pipeline. And this is where the branch executes after 31 stages. Okay. So during these many pipeline stages, essentially it means these many cycles, if you make a misprediction, you will be fetching from the wrong path. Essentially you fetching wrong instructions. Okay. But ultimately it leads to wastage of cycles. So, so which is why as you make your pipeline deeper and deeper, you need better predictors, you need more accuracy. Um, today's Intel processors don't have uh, such a deep pipeline, it's actually shorter, the pipeline is much shorter, but definitely bigger than 10, 10 stages. Right? So you still need better predictors. So what is branch misprediction penalty? That's the number of cycles between prediction and verification. Okay, so from the time, you, the time you know whether the prediction was correct or not. Okay, right? So until verification, you will believe the prediction and fetch along that path. On verification, you will find that you made a mistake, in which case you have to throw out all the work that you have done, right? and start afresh from the corrected path. So essentially, on a misprediction, this is the amount of time that you lose. These are the cycles that you lose. Okay. And remember that this is the minimum misprediction penalty. It can be larger. For example, there may be a branch which requires some data to execute. And that data may get delayed because it may have a cache miss or something. Okay, right? So for example, if you have a load instruction that um, loads from this address in, regist uh, address in register 2, and then there is a branch instruction which consumes R2, right? Then what may happen is that even if the branch has reached its you know, designated pipeline stage for execution, it may not be able to execute because R2 is not yet available. Right? Because the load instruction before it is still pending because it took a cache miss when to memory to fetch the data. Okay, right? So this is minimum. It may be larger from many branches. So deeper the pipeline is, more work is lost due to this prediction. So what are the challenges? <coughs> so these are the these are the basic research problems in this particular area. First one is um, how do you remove destructive aliasing in branch history data? So remember that uh, in the example that we discussed yesterday, in the GAG example, we had severe aliasing in one of the BHT entries. Okay, right? So the question is how do you really get rid of this problem? Okay. So in essence, this is really a hashing problem. You have to come up with smart hash functions. Right? So um, I'll discuss uh, some of these today. Uh, maybe one of, one of them just. And uh, the second one is there is a need for larger history. Because larger history often helps. Right? So uh, if you can look over a large window of history, it normally gives you a much better idea about what's happening in the world this much. However, here the problem is that there is an exponential relationship between the history length and the storage that you require. So just to remind you, so if this is x, then this is 2 to the power of x, right? Okay. So this is the this is the exponential relationship. 
I want this to be bigger you know, so that I can encapsulate bigger history, okay, right? But that makes it taller, okay? and that this growth is exponential. Okay? So that's a big problem actually. So that's a that's a that's a that's what makes this very challenging. The question is, what kind of other branch predictors that I can come up with where this exponential relationship goes away? I can have bigger history, uh, but I have a predictor which doesn't have this problem. Okay. So, so but bigger history would also uh, need now more time to hit the steady state. Yes, that is true. So there will be a bigger learning time, but that's hopefully you know one once you change your trade, it's just one time. Every time you go over a phase change, then this will happen once. Once you learn, then you can predict better. Um, better prediction for data dependent branches. So this is a very big problem. So for example, um, you might remember from your uh, sorting algorithms, right? So a typical comparison that you do there is right? You often do this, in, for example, with bubbles. Okay. It is extremely difficult to predict this much because it depends on the pattern of your data that you have in the array. Okay. So um, uh, this this may even be better, but think about doing um, something like AI compared against some value here, some constant, let's say. Okay. So these kind of branches are very frequent in programs. So these are data dependent branches. Um, and these are the branches that, that lower your prediction accuracy. Because essentially what you're asking is, uh, how predictable is this value? That's what really you're asking. Okay. And that's extremely difficult to predict. And the third problem is not really about direction predictors, but um, it's about efficient handling of indirect calls. Okay. So uh, if you have a direct call, that's fairly easy to predict with the help of branch target buffer. The BTB will be correct every time okay, because the target is constant. Okay, right? For indirect calls, the target will vary depending on the state of your program. Right? Because it's, these are essentially function pointers or virtual methods. Uh, the target will depend on um, what you are really doing. And your BTB will be extremely inaccurate in this case. And remember that for calls, procedural calls, we really cannot take any help from the direction predictor. So the only machinery that we have for predicting calls is the BTB. That's it. There is nothing else actually. Okay. Right? So this is a big problem. And this is a big problem essentially, uh, especially in your object-oriented languages, uh, because they have virtual methods, like in uh, C++ or, or, or your uh, Java language. So programs written in these languages have a lot of indirect calls. So this has to be addressed. So pretty much these are the four problems that uh, that are challenging today. So uh, let's go through what each of them uh, quickly. Some solution at least. Um, it's impossible to give you you know what what has happened in all these four departments as such. So um, there is a family of predictors known as G skew predictors okay, that try to address the first problem of reducing BHT alas. Okay. So here the idea is that you have an odd number of uh, branch history tables. Right? And these are all GAG predictors. So I'll be a little more general here. So suppose this is your global history register. And uh, this is my branch PC. I have three different hash functions, h1, h2, and h3, that index into my VHTs. This is VHT1. Right? OK. All right? So what I want is, um, OK, so finally, how do you combine these three predictions? Any suggestion? Majority vote, right? That's why I wanted to have odd number of uh, PhDs. So I take a majority vote, and that's my final prediction. Okay. So the question is that, how do I get rid of this particular problem of the last? Okay. So there is a requirement on these three hash functions. If there are two addresses, 
that conflict in BHT1 because of H1. You should try to design H2 and H3 such that they don't conflict in these two BHTs. So even if this BHT for that particular, those two addresses, this BHT gives you very poor prediction, these two will actually be correct and you will win in the majority vote. Okay. All right. Is this clear? So that's, that's, that's essentially a problem of designing hash functions. Okay. Um, so one hash function that people often use, rather one family of hash functions. So I'll simplify this a little bit. So I'll assume that the input to the hash function is some value x. Okay, let's first fix these sizes. So let's suppose uh, this is so be some power of 2. Let's say 2 to the n. Right, okay. So um, I'll write so x is essentially a combination of the GHR and PC, okay, which is the input to the hash function. All right. So I write x in base 2 to the n. Okay, so I can write it as, uh, uh, let's say x0 plus x1 into the n into the 2 n, etc. Right? Okay. So um, if I do a modulo 2 to the n hash here, right? so if I do if I just do h1x, where h1 is a modular hash, right? what is the result of that? Yeah? x0, right? Okay. x0. Is that clear to everybody? That h1x, if h1 is just a modular 2 to the n hash function, then h1 exists. x0. Right? Okay. Now, what I want is, suppose I have x and x prime. And both of them have the same x right? In that case, they will alliance on the first table. Right? I want these two not to alliance for h2 and h3. Okay. So what people often use for uh, for h2, how many of you know about perfect shuffle? Have you heard of perfect shuffle? of a big stream. Okay. So what, what it means is that if you are given a big stream, so there are two types of perfect shuffle. You divide into two, two parts. All right. So let's suppose this is n bits. Okay. So you divide into two parts, again by two and n by two. Right. And what you do is, you put the bits from here alternatively. So you just insert them here. Right? So for example, if you have 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? So you divide it in this way. You insert a 0 here, so it becomes 1, 0. Then you have this 0 here. Insert the next 0. 1 here, next 0, 1, 1. So what have I done? What have I done? This one here, this one here. So alternately, I take bits from this side and this side. So that's a perfect shuffle of this particular string. Okay, right? So I could do it in some. I could do it in a different way also by starting with this particular bit. Okay. So instead of inserting zero here, I could have started with zero first, and then inserted one and so on. Right? So I can alternate in two different ways. Okay. Right? The function that I apply on x, that is h two, is h one x plus a perfect shuffle of x. H1 applied on that. Sorry. Oops. If you have two addresses that map to the same slot for H1, this will have actually a very low probability of that happening, this particular hash function for these two addresses. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the proof of that. So perfect shuffle is uh, one of the hash functions that have this particular property. Um, that if, uh, if two addresses alias in one of the BHTs, they will not alias in the other two. So for H3, you can choose uh, H1x plus sigma square of x1. Okay. So you can just apply 
apply shuffle twice. Right? And there are nice properties of shuffle. If you keep on shuffling, ultimately you get back the same string okay, after some time. Right? So um, if you have too many hash functions, you cannot do this actually. Okay. For a small number of hash functions, these are three hash functions, you can use it like that. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic thing clear that what I require here, right? Then I have a hash function h1 which has a conflict. Under that condition, I'll make sure that h2 and h3 will not have a conflict. So the majority function will pick this one, the correct prediction, okay, the elastic prediction. Um, and why is it called a skew predictor is because uh, now people found out that actually if you make the tables of different sizes, you get even better prediction accuracy. Okay. So essentially what happens is that these BHTs will now have different size of history inputs. Okay, right? Now, even there are papers that try to look at the relationship between these histories. Okay. For example, if this history is n bit, how many histories should I put in a BHT2 and BHT3 to, to get better accuracy? So there are papers which look at geometric history lines that increase geometrically, and that turns out to be the best actually. Right? So um, anyway, so so that's your GSQ family of predictors. Uh, they are extremely good and have very high accuracy. If you want to read up on that, I, I can give you some references. Send me an email. Okay. Now the second problem is the history relationship, right? So here essentially we have the same problem. I have n-bit history here. I'll have an exponentially large table to the power of n entries. So how do you get rid of that? So um, neural networks have some beautiful properties, and that actually comes into play here. So how many of you have heard of parsec counts? Okay. okay. So it's a simple, uh, simple thing. Actually, let me quickly give you an overview of uh, what a parsec count does. <coughs> So perceptron is the simplest kind of a neural network. Okay, right? So um, it has a bunch of inputs. So for our purpose here, the inputs are history bits. Right? So let's suppose I have any bits of history. Okay, right? And what I do is I weigh them with some weights. Right, and there is an extra input called a bias. All right. Okay. So what comes out here, this is just a sum of this. All right. And on this, you apply a function. So this one is going to be a real number, right? Okay, what you get. Because the weights are all real numbers. And what you, you apply a function which gives you a binary output. Right. So often the function applied here is the sine function. Sine by sine, I mean not uh, trigonometric sine function. You take the sine of this value, positive or negative. Okay, all right. If it is negative, you out, output 0. If it is positive, you output 1. Okay, all right. so, so what have we got? So the perceptron is same as f of summation wi hi plus the bias, right? Okay, all right. So why is this relevant at all? Can somebody guess? So I'm saying this is my branch predictor now. I give, a, give some history, I get a binary output, right? And it's relevant because a branch predictor is essentially a Boolean function. We're trying to learn a Boolean function, nothing else. So, um, so your history can be seen as a vector in the dimensional space. If you want to include the bias, it's actually in plus one dimensional space. All right. You want to include this one also. So it's a vector, all right. And what you're trying to what what we're trying to see is, um, given this vector, you tell me whether this vector belongs to um, the taken side of the space or the not taken side of the space. Right? Okay. So this one here is a plane, right? It's a hyperplane in the inhabitation space. This one. Okay. So essentially what you are trying to do is you're trying to learn this particular plane. So 
in the two-dimensional space, if I have just two history bits, right, H0 and H1, so I may have a bunch of histories. So after this history, I always see a 1, that is a taken. Right? Whenever a branch comes up with this history, I see that this branch is taken. So I, I mark these histories as crosses here, okay, right? And I may have histories like these history points, whenever they show up, the branch is actually not taken. Right? And what are we trying to come up with? A plane that separates these two. Okay. So like for example, this one. This is what this perceptron is trying to learn with the weights. Okay. So you have to come up with the weights so that you get this particular plane. Okay. And then when we apply the sine function, it will clearly separate these two. You say that, oh, it's negative. So you belong to this particular part. Okay, all right. So your weights will, will be adjusted. So there is a training algorithm to adjust the weights, which I will not discuss here. So here, the, what is to be observed is that I don't have a VHD anymore. I can make my history as large as I can. Only thing I remember is the weights. So now in storage, when it becomes linear in your history size. If I have an n bit history, I need n weights to remember. That's it. Alright? So now of course uh, a single perceptron cannot predict all branches. Okay, right? For example, if I have a pattern like this, so whenever I see a history of 0, 0, the branch is not taken after that. Okay, right? Whenever I see, I, so this is H0 and this is H1. Okay, right? So H0 and H1. Whenever I see a history of 1, 1, the branch is not taken. Right? Okay. Whenever I see a history of 0, 1, the branch is taken. Whenever I see a history of 1, 0, the branch is taken. Okay, right? There is no plane that can separate these two. Okay. It's impossible. You cannot know. Whatever you try, you'll always mix up something. If you draw this plane, two different points are on, on two sides. If you try this plane, same problem. If you try this plane, same problem. So perceptron won't be able to predict this particular branch. Okay. You need multiple perceptrons. So I'll not get into that. Uh, the point here is that. Um, this problem is actually solved. Okay. I can now have large history and my storage over is linear in the history length. It's no longer exponential. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> there is a predictor called a profit critic predictor. Um, so this is a very general kind of predictor uh, prediction technique um, which are often called overriding predictors. So, uh, so let me give you an analogy. Suppose you are um, you are in a city and you're navigating through the city in your car, all right? And when you're driving the car, your friend is sitting inside, right? And you're trying to get to a destination where you have been before. Okay. So, so the but but you just quite don't remember uh, clearly how to go get there, right? So what happens is that um, you are trying out different lanes, okay. and whenever you get into a lane, you proceed a little far, your friend tells you that it doesn't seem like we have been here before, it seems very different. Okay. So you quickly backtrack, start some other way. You go along that path a little bit and your friend again says, this looks new to me, I don't think we have seen this. Right? So the point here is that, after a branch prediction is done, okay. you start going along some path, right? Okay. Suppose we suppose we get some of those history bits from the wrong path or from the correct path too. <coughs> Can that improve prediction at least? Right? So you predict a branch, you start fetching from the predicted path. Very soon you will encounter one more branch, okay, right, on the predicted path. You look at the outcome of this branch. And then, well, we break this branch, okay, right? And you go along the predicted path again. You encounter another branch, 
Suppose I give you this two extra bits after you have made prediction of this function. Can you now tell me whether this prediction was correct or not? So it's actually incorporating a little bit of future information. <coughs> Notice that this is not same as giving you two extra history bits on that side. Okay, so what I'm saying is that suppose you make a prediction after 10 bits of history, and then you get to see two more branch outcomes. This is not same as giving you n plus two bits of history. I can attach two more history bits there, but it's not going to be that good as this one. Because here it is telling you that after this prediction, have you ever seen these two predictions or not? Okay, right? When you went along the tight path, did you see these two predictions to happen in the past? If the answer is no, that means you must have made a misprediction. So this is essentially an overriding predictor where you make a prediction first, then observe for a while, and then you try to correct that prediction. Okay. So the first predictor is called the prophet. The second one is often the critic of that prediction, okay. whether that was correct or not. So the second predictor is actually predicting the correctness of the first one. Okay. So this one is very helpful um, in uh, often predicting uh, data dependent branches correctly. Okay. Um, but anyway, nonetheless, uh, predicting data dependent branches remains a big problem even today. So it's a huge problem, um, and there is no good solution even today. So the, the gap is huge. The second, the, the, the last one is uh, how do you handle uh, internet calls, right? So here, uh, one solution that is often used is uh, you use the path history to index into the BTP instead of using the PC to index into the BTP. So essentially what I'm saying is that before you reach the call, you must have seen a few branch pieces. Right? So that defines your path through which you actually make the call. So that has a very good correlation with where you are going to, going to, uh, uh, going to make the call. So what I'm saying is that um, so suppose you have a function f and there is a function pointer here which takes you somewhere, right? Okay. What I'm saying is that the path that leads to this particular call determines, has a very good correlation with where you're going. Okay. Whether you call some function x through this pointer also, or some function y through this pointer determines through which path you came. Okay. Right. So instead of using the PC of this branch to index with the BTB, you use a hash of these pieces that you have seen along the path to this particular call. Okay. So that is, that is also seen to, to prove accuracy. Right. So of course, uh, this is very hand -wavy. If you want details, let me know. I will give you papers so you can read up on that. Okay. So um, one problem that is that cross cuts uh, all these uh, 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 prediction uh, research is criticality of branches. And here the main point is that not all, all branches are equally important. Okay. So you might end up investing a lot of time trying to predict a branch um, which is not very important. So that's not really a good thing to do. Okay. So predicting some correctly um, is critical to performance while others have very little impact on performance. Okay. So it is known that all branches are not equally critical. The question is why is that? So here's a list of uh, factors that often influence your branch criticality. So one obvious thing is misprediction failures. So when you misprediction a branch, how many cycles do you lose before you go along with that part, right? And every branch doesn't have equal misprediction penalty. The reason we have already discussed, one of the reasons is that if the branch is data dependent and the data is not ready, the branch may have to wait longer. So minimum is the number of five stages between last direction prediction and branch execution. Right? So remember that we can have multiple direction predictors in multiple five stages. The last one to make a prediction is uh, hoped to be the best best one. From that point onward to the time you execute the branch is the misprediction penalty. Uh, certain branches may get delayed due to data dependence. Um, and predicting these correctly is important for performance because here, if you mispredict, you're going to lose a large number of cycles. So predicting these branches is very important if you have data-dependent branches. 
The second point, uh, criticality factor is cache pollution due to wrong path execution. So when you're going along the wrong path, you're bringing in data and instruction into a data and instruction caches. Right? Um, conflicting instruction and data working sets along the two branch paths will cause big problems. So for example, suppose along one path, you have certain number of certain instructions in the cache. When you go the wrong path, these instructions may conflict with these instructions in the cache and may actually evict these instructions out of the cache. Okay. So next time when you come along the correct path, you start taking instruction caches. Same may happen with the data. And criticality of the correct path, that is, for example, if the correct path always starts with an instruction or data cache miss. In that case, you want this to be correct because otherwise, what will happen is that you go along the wrong path, you find out that you made a mistake, you cancel all the instructions, you start fetching from the correct path, and at the very beginning, you take an instruction cache miss. So this entire latency will actually show up in your execution because you cannot do anything actually at the time. You don't have the instruction to proceed. The pipeline is empty. We are waiting for the instruction page to complete. Okay. So that also adds to the criticality of branches. So the branches that often have these things um, become critical. And those are the branches that you definitely want to predict correctly. Okay. So um, how do you go about doing this? Um, so critical branches need high prediction accuracy. Identifying branches that mispredict frequently is actually easy. It's not very difficult. And the reason is that you can just have a small cache of recently mispredicted branch pieces. So you can maintain a cache which will at any point in time tell you which are the branches that mispredicted frequently. Okay, right? However, all of these may not be critical. So that's what is most important. A branch may have a very high misprediction accuracy, but even if you increase its accuracy by a large amount, it may not affect performance. Because it's not critical. So uh, discovering good features that correlate well with the behavior of the critical branches is difficult. And this is a very hot research topic. So if you want to uh, invest time on branch predictors, um, you can look into that. Um, so here by good features, I mean uh, what program property would tell you that this branch is actually critical. All right. <coughs> Most of these branches are actually data dependent. That's what it turns out ultimately. And prediction accuracy depends on the entropy of the data they depend on. So as you know, if um, some pieces of data have high entropy, then they are usually not very predictable. Right? You want low entropy in the data to be predictable. Today's best direction predictor has very high prediction accuracy, which means small number of branches actually cause most of the mispredictions, and these are highly critical branches. The performance gap between such a predictor and the oracle is large. So, so that's no Which means, even if you have 97% prediction accuracy, the major chunk of work is still left. Okay, and this is the hard part. Actually. So, um, so, so there is a big room for improvement. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the big problems. But, uh, identifying critical branches. So a uh, quick summary of control hazards. Um, redirect fetch from various stages of the pipeline with increasingly better prediction. So some of the machineries that we have discussed are branch target buffer, return address stack, direction predictors. Um, the fetcher selects the most appropriate next PC every cycle from among different indications coming from different stages. Um, research problems, focus effort on critical data dependent branches. What features correlate well with the behavior of these branches? Can the compiler offer help in any way? Um, one of the things that, that is very interesting is, um, can I pre-execute branches in a separate thread? So today we have a lot of threads and cores in our processors, right? So what I can do is I can run my program on one core and only execute the branches in some other code. So I can pre-execute certain number of branches and actually can know the outcome beforehand, before this code actually gets to that point. Okay. Of course, it's not as easy as said. Um, you have to figure out the, the instructions that lead to this branch, which we have to execute, actually. Okay. Um, but there are proposals that try to do this, actually. Okay. All right. Um, so any question before I uh, move on to some other types of hazard? Okay, so you never have any questions. Okay, so um, 
So the other type of hazard that is important in a pipeline is, a, is data hazard. Um, and this arises because pipelining disturbs the sequential thought process. And um, so data dependencies among the instructions start to show up. So here is an example. So the first instruction um, adds R2 and R3, puts the result in R1. The next instruction subtracts um, R5 from R1 and then puts the result in R4. Third one adds R1, R7, puts in R6. And uh, this one ors R1, R9, puts in R8, and exhorts R1, R11, puts in R10. So here you can see that uh, result of add is needed by all the instructions, right? So in the pipeline, what you can, so this is shown in pipeline actually. So this is the add pipeline, it is going through here, okay? That instruction will execute here, but write back to the register file here, okay, right? Other instructions will read R1 in this stage, right? This is the stage where we read the register file. So as you can see here, um, these three instructions marked in red will actually read wrong values. Okay, right? This XOR instruction will read the correct value because it happens after the value is written back. Is this problem clear? Okay. So how do you solve this problem? Should I stall these three instructions? So this, this instruction can be stalled by how many cycles? Right? I can move the decode here. So it can stall by three cycles, then everything will be fine, right? And after that everything will flow through as there. Right? Stall by three cycles. Are there any better solution? Does anybody see any better solution? that can be done. Where is the value produced? R1. Which five stage? Yeah? X. X. So the value is known here. So can I do something? Sorry? Directly pass the value. Exactly. So since the value is available in the pipeline somewhere, I can pass the value to this guy. I can pass the value to this guy, and then I can pass the value to this guy, and this guy will read the value from, uh, yeah, read the value from the register file. Okay. So, uh, so how do we avoid increasing CPI? So stalling is clearly not acceptable. So um, there is something called a phased register file which solves the three cycle apart wrong. So what is that? What it does is that, <coughs> just like the way we had a, you know, we got rid of one branch vowel right, by doing a phase branch execution, here what, what we can do is, we can say that register write back completes in the first half of the cycle. All right? And register read happens only in the second half of the cycle. In that case, I can actually save this one. This one will actually get the correct value from the register file in that case. Okay. So this actually solves three cycle apart raw dependencies. By the way, these are called raw dependencies or read after write. Hazards, okay, right? You're reading after a write. So these are three cycle apart raw hazard happening in this instruction. That can be resolved by having a phase register file. You can complete your register write in first half of the cycle and do the read in the second. That still doesn't solve the problem with these two instructions. Okay, right? So as, a, as somebody has suggested, why don't we forward the correct value just in time, right? So this value is produced here. I can directly forward it to the input of the ALU, all right? And that's exactly when it needs. So what will happen is that it will read a wrong value in this particular stage, which will be overwritten by, a new, by the correct value here before it enters the Okay. Similarly, if you remember the pipeline, this value will be carried forward in the pipeline uh, latches. So here it will be available here, right? And that can forward to the this end. 
the same value R1. Okay. So um, read wrong value in uh, ID RF stage, but bypass value overrides it. So the question is how do you how do you really, how do you really implement it? Right. Um, so you always feed bypass value to the ALU input. The question is how many sources in bypass network? Um, and do we need bypass to memory stage also? Here we are showing, showing bypass only to the execution stage. Okay, so first let's take each of the questions at a time. Right? Um, so how do we implement this bypass? Let's focus on this bypass. I read a value from the register file, which is wrong. Right? So there are two questions now. That is, before I enter the value to the A, how do I know that I read a wrong value? That's the first question. And if I can figure out that I did a wrong value, how do I override it with a new value? What kind of logic circuitry I require here? What tells you that I did a wrong value? So if you have forgotten the instructions tree, I can show you. So you're talking about these two instructions at this point. Here to here bypass. Yes. Okay. And now I'm reading from R1. Okay. So there's a, I'm reading the wrong value. Uh, yeah, so what kind of, uh, what kind of operations am I doing to resolve that? That I'm reading the wrong value? So comparing, comparing what? The uh, destination register of uh, the previous instruction with the uh, source register of this. Exactly. So I need to compare both the sources with the destination of this one. Correct? Okay, if there is any match, I know that a raw hazard has happened. Right? So, um, <clears throat> so what does that mean? So let me take you back to our So how does this change? Can somebody suggest? I have two inputs coming into the ALU, right? And register file produces this value and this value, right? I have a multiplexer here, which depending on the opcode selects either the immediate or the register value, and here either the next PC, uh, PC plus 4, or the register 5 value. Okay. So, how do I modify this to enable the bypass? Yeah? So if I ask you to write a piece of program that describes this logic, what would that be? That might be more, that might be easier to think actually in that way. Okay, I'm writing a C program, what should I write it? What am I comparing? Yeah? How should it change? I have to somehow change the inputs to the ALU based on some indication that I made a mistake. Needs to store what was the uh, right register, the destination register. That is carried forward. Remember that there is a latch. Yeah. Um, so when so we have an add instruction, right? Uh, which is currently executing in this code cycle, right? The sub instruction is currently here, right? One cycle behind, reading the register file. Okay. So that means what? The add instructions, source register, um, and source registers and the destination registers are in this latch, are stored in this latch. You can assume that, okay, right? 
and the Savi structure is currently being decoded. Okay. So, Where should I put the, put the comparison? Which state is it? In the decode stage. In the decode stage. Why do you want it to be in the decode stage? So that the decode stage will tell me whether the okay. uh, address is right or not. Okay. okay. So okay. And then and so that that for where? In the next, while doing the execution, I will get to know whether to get this info from uh, Whatever the input of the decode stage is. The problem with putting it in the decode stage is that um, you get to know my I mean, sub instructions source registers only after it's decoded. So you probably get to know it uh, probably here before you put it to the register. Right? Yeah. Can I put it in the execution stage? Is that possible? We can put it in execution. We will then use these two matches, the TX. Which one? Uh, the add instruction would be in this latch. Yes, okay. And the, the destination of this compared with the sources of this. Okay, all right. So I need two comparators, right? I need to compare the destination of this latch with the two sources here. Right? I need two comparators. Okay, so comparison output goes there. What do I do with the compact output? So I have two comparators. Okay. <coughs> and what does it compare? This is my X mem. So it takes the register identifier RD, right? Compares it with RS. RD, RT. Okay, so it tells me a yes no answer to compare. So what? How do I use it? I need to override the inputs to the AD. This one is wrong. This one could be wrong. Both could be wrong, one could be wrong, both could be correct. On the inside. Can I output of ALU to uh, decode muxes and use output of comparators as an electron? These muxes? Yes. So what you are suggesting is um, <coughs> So I have one more input to this mix, isn't it? Right? So both these masses have an input now, extra input, which is output of the ADU. Okay, very good. So here is my ADU. So the output goes into two masses. So these masses already have two more inputs, right? So the selection logics will be opcode and combination of these comparator outcomes. So here, for example, if the comparator says yes, uh, they actually match, I should pick up the ALU output okay, instead of picking up the one coming from the register file. Okay. All right. Okay. The other input will remain unchanged, which will be selected by the opcode. Whether if I'm selecting the immediate, then of course it doesn't matter whether there is a match or not. All right. In that case, hopefully there will not be a match. Right. Is this there? So this path is known as the bypass path. Okay. Coming from the destination of the ALU to the, sorry, output of the ALU to the input of the ALU. So this ALU is hanging actually. Yeah. Okay. Right? Is it here? Okay. Now, um,
How do I do this by us? The next instruction. That also has to happen at the input of the ALU, right? But the only thing is that the input is coming from a different pipe stage. Right? So when this instruction is executing, this instruction is, is now in the write back. Okay, right? That means the value that it is writing to the register is currently in this latch, which I need to bypass. Right? So what that means is you have to add one more input to this particular multiplex. Right? And your selection will now be based on Rd of this and Rt of this, Rd of this and Rs of this. So you need two more components. Okay, right? So now there is a small problem. Although probably this example doesn't have a problem. Okay, when the problem arises, we talk about it. Okay. So is this clear? Okay. <coughs> so now, how do you answer this particular question? So we know how to implement it roughly. We have some idea about that. Okay. We need bigger boxes in front of the ALUs and we need comparators that will drive the selection. Okay. How many sources in the bypass network? So in this case, I have shown two sources. One coming from um, coming from X mem latch is actually X mem latch. Okay, this output will be taken from the X mem latch, um, and one coming from the mem write back latch. Are there any other sources in this particular pipeline from where I need to bypass? <coughs> and. Uh, is it that the destination is always a in? That is, is the destination always x extend, or there could be other destinations as well? Do the questions make sense, or you lost? So, do I need to bypass from the fetch stage by any chance? Could there be a situation for them to bypass from the fetch stage something? Cannot be, right? I don't. What do I produce in the fetch stage? I produce an instruction. And that cannot be an input to some instruction. Okay. An instruction cannot be an input to an instruction. Okay. In the decode stage, I produce some internal decoded signals. They also cannot be useful. Okay. Here I produce values. May require bypass. Here also I produce values. That may require bypass. Do I need a bypass from here? No? Are you sure? So if I want to bypass from here, where where can I where do I bypass? What are the possible inputs? If I bypass from here to here, I can bypass from here to here. The next instruction that will come here will have the decode stage here. We we'll read the file here and we'll get the right value in here. So I should never need a bypass from here to here. That's not needed. What about this to this and this to this? Are they needed? If I want to bypass from here to here, that means I'm I'm bypassing the result of this instruction to this instruction for it to write back. That doesn't make any sense, right? Why should I do that? What about this to this? What does the memory stage mean? It needs an address for sure, and it needs a value for storage structures. What if this instruction was a storage structure? which stores R1 to memory. Suppose this instruction, so I'll write down the instruction. Okay. It uses R1 to compute the address, it stores the value R1 to the address. 
So this particular bypass, so I'm talking about DC instruction. Okay. So this particular bypass takes care of um, forwarding this particular value to one operator. Okay. The question is, why should I bypass the other value also at the time? Why do I have to delay till this point? There's no reason, right? So we are currently, so we need just these two sources, X and MEM. MEM will bypass two kinds of values. One is values produced by ALU instructions here, which are bypassed one cycle rate, and values produced by load instructions. All right. okay. So that takes care of this particular question, right? Okay. So we'll come back to this question next time.